Hi, this is Pastor Ken from Park Place Community Church, and we want to thank you for watching this teaching video. We hope that it's a blessing and a help to you. God bless you. So, so yesterday I made an executive decision. Well, me and God, me and God made an executive decision yesterday. Our, our series, our, our series that we've been doing, Can I Really Change? How many of you have noticed it's been morphing into a series on anxiety? And, and I've been wanting to do a series of anxi on anxiety. And it seems like this series has just kind of been morphing into it. So I made an executive decision. We're just going to allow it to morph into a series on anxiety. And we're changing the name. We're going to keep talking about the same stuff. And there's some things that I want to circle back to in the chain series about habits, how, how you know, in vital or important or affecting habits are in our life. So I want to circle back to that. But we're, we're starting a new series this morning, and it's called Be Anxious for nothing. And some of you may recognize our little mascot. We have a new mascot now for this series. That's um, anxiety from um, the movie Inside Out. If you've seen the movie um, Inside Out 2, right? Inside Out 2. I have a corrector back in the back. Thank you for correcting me on that. Inside Out 2, which I haven't seen. We went to a couple movies where we saw the preview of it. It looked awesome, looks hilarious, so I want to see it. But but she her name is Anxiety, and she's going to be our our mascot for this series. And um, it, it, the movie is about all the emotions in this young girl's life, and one of them is anxiety. So be anxious for nothing. And one of the biggest causes of anxiety is something that we have talked about previously, and that is catastrophizing. And, and this is the mascot from our, our last series, and we're not going to drop him. We're going to keep him because he's so cute, right? The, 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 the catastrophizer is, is so cute, but he's cute on the outside, but a train wreck on the inside because he catastrophizes about everything. And, and we're not going to drop him. We're, we're going to stick with him because he is us, because right? we all do that. And in case there's anybody new, and I think there are some new people here this morning, here's what catastrophizing is. You hear something unsettling, and in your mind, you blow it up to the worst possible crisis scenario that has, that was interesting. <laughs> oh, is it? Uh, oh, uh, well. You'll have to just believe me when I'm saying so, so we blow it up into the worst possible crisis scenario that has no semblance of reality at all. In our minds, it's real. In our mind, we build up this thing that, that we think is real, but it has no semblance in reality. And can we just admit, just can we all just admit that the we all do this. We all blow up these things in our minds. Some more than others, there's psychological, there's sociological, you know, how we were raised, how secure we were as a child, things like that, that, that are reasons for it. But I know people that had a very secure childhood, great childhood, but they still do this. So um, can, can I just, brag a little bit on myself about this. Can I, can I just admit, I'm a world-class catastrophizer. I can take a, a, a situation, just blow it into something that has no semblance of reality, zero to 60 on the crisis scale. Now, thankfully, over the years, I have gotten pretty good at, at breaking down that catastrophizing, so, so, so that's good. Thankfully, I've done that. But of course, we all know that if left unchecked, and, and weirdly enough, I'm having problems with, with mine at the same time. <laughs> it must be something in the air. Um, 
Yeah, this is really weird. There we go. Um, so, so we all do this. We all have problems with it. And um, did, okay, that's back. <laughs> Hopefully that'll bring mine back. Here we go, here we go. Okay, so um, something very profound came out of last week's message, something very profound. And I didn't even realize it until this week. Probably one of the top 10 most profound things that I've ever had in a message. And I think I'm ready to say that the last series, morphing into this series, is probably one, if not the most profound series I've ever done. So let's see this profound thing again here out of our foundational scriptures, Philippians chapter four, starting at verse six. It says, don't be anxious, and some versions say worry, don't worry. And how we defined it last week was to not be overly concerned about anything. We can be concerned. There's lots of things in life that we need to be concerned about. But this is saying, don't be overly concerned to the point where it, it, it consumes all your thinking and consumes your whole life. Don't do that. It's not good for you. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, and this is the two deals on the table. This is him giving us an alternative. He just he doesn't just say, don't be anxious and just figure it out on your own. He says, don't be anxious. Rather, gives us an alternative. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petition along with giving thanks. Now, this giving thanks we'll get into next week. Uh, I saw something this week that's going to blow your mind about this, but we don't have time to get into it today. But we'll, we'll do that next week. But it's simply this. If we just simplify it, if we just break it down to its most simple form, what the Apostle Paul is saying here is replace worry or anxious thoughts with prayer. Instead of ruminating over these catastrophizing thoughts, blowing it up big, bigger than reality, instead of focusing on those, replace those with prayer. Replace anxious thoughts with bringing our concerns to God. Just real simple. Instead of worrying about them, talk to God about them. Instead of just ruminating over and over and over, say, God, I've got this challenge. I've got this thing that I'm dealing with. Talk to God about them. And then in verse seven, we see this super important, powerful word, then. Then. And, and the word then, sometimes we downplay the thens of the Bible. Then it means the next stuff he's about to talk about, it won't work unless you do the previous. So if you do this, then you will have that. So you have to make a decision to replace worry with prayer. And then to the degree that you do that is the degree you will have the peace of God. Then, after you do that, then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding. How many of you have experienced peace that just doesn't make sense? <laughs> there, there's just so much going on in your life. Everything seems to be falling apart. But yet you have this peace. It's because this peace goes above your understanding. You don't have to understand it. As long as you do the first part, replace worry with prayer, then you'll have this peace that exceeds all understanding and it will keep your hearts and minds. Sometimes I think in the church, we don't talk about the mind enough. We talk a lot about the spirit, the heart, things like that, but we don't talk about 
the mind that much. It'll keep our hearts and minds safe. This peace will keep our minds safe. The word safe there means guarded or under protective custody. I used to, when I would talk about this, I used to use the Secret Service as, as the example, but how many of you know they're not doing so great right now? <laughs> now, the, the guys, remember when President Trump got shot? What, what did the Secret Service guys do? They dove on top of him. Where's the next bullet gonna hit? It's gonna hit them, right? They dove on top of him. So what this is saying is that this peace of God when something attacks our mind, this peace will cover us. This peace will dive over us. So whatever is attacking us won't get to us. The peace of God will keep our minds safe in Christ Jesus. But only if you do that first part. Only if you decide. And this is the profound part. This, this is simple. And sometimes we miss profound because it's so simple. We think, oh, if it's simple, it can't be that great. The, sometimes the most profound things are the most simple things. And this simple but profound, and this will revolutionize your life. I promise you, don't miss this. You cannot have that peace if you choose to continue to worry. If you choose to continue to worry, you cannot have that peace. It's your choice. Remember earlier in, in the series when we talked about Deuteronomy 30, 19, where it says, God has laid before us these two choices, life and death, blessing and cursing. The, the choice is ours. God does not make the choice for us. He'll walk through the choice with us. But he does not make the choice for us. It's up to you. But these two things are mutually exclusive. You can choose to worry or you can have peace. Your choice, but they're mutually exclusive. And regardless of the choice you make, God still loves you. He's not punishing you. Oh, you decided to worry. I'm going to withhold peace. No, he's not doing that. He's telling us a principle of life. And that principle is worry eradicates peace. And we've all experienced that, right? How many of you have been so consumed with worry, anxious thoughts, and felt peace at the same time? They're, they're mutually exclusive. You, you cannot have both. And the opposite is true also. Peace eradicates worry. You can choose which one you want. Then the Apostle Paul lays out this perfect plan of how to overcome catastrophizing or anxiety. And it's all about what? We saw this last week. It's all about our thoughts. Our, our thoughts are what controls this whole thing. And who would have thought that it, that would be so controversial? Sometimes people think that so controversial that we talk about the, the mind or our thoughts. But I noticed that in the Bible, the Greek word that's translated thoughts is used 222 times. More than heaven, more than the references to heaven are thoughts. And that's just one version of it. There's thoughts, there's thinking, there's mindful, there's all these. It, it's talked about a lot in the Bible. And remember what our goal is, our whole goal in this overcoming anxiety or, or overcoming these, these thoughts, our whole goal is having our thoughts come into divine alignment with God. The way that God looks at things, the way that God thinks about things, we want to come into divine alignment with that. Now here's where people sometimes will get tripped up with this is Isaiah 55, 9. We've talked about this many times in the past. It says, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 
So people look at that and say, well, we can't have God's thoughts. But is it really saying that we can't have God's thoughts? Or is it just saying the truth, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts? How many of you recognize that? That God just thinks at a different plane. But it's not saying that we can't adopt God's thoughts, that we can't get closer to God's thoughts. So if God's view or God's thoughts about a specific situation or, or really specifically about us, if God's thoughts about us are different than our thoughts about us, we should adopt God's thoughts because they're higher. <laughs> he has a different perspective than we do. He can see things much farther uh, in the future. He can see all these pieces, how they interact. His thoughts are higher, so we should adopt his thoughts. I think if you looked at God's nails, if you looked at God's nails, they would be perfectly manicured. They wouldn't be all chewed up. Do you know why? Because God's not up in heaven chewing his nails, biting his nails, worried about how something is going to work out. So if we're down here all worried about something biting our nails, we should adopt God's thoughts because his thoughts are higher. So the Apostle Paul, then after telling us this, he lays out this perfect plan to do it. And we see the plan in the very next verse, Philippians 4, 8. He says, finally, and we saw last week how he had said finally before, and he kind of returns back to it. He was talking about forgetting the past. And, and what is forgetting? Forgetting is taking it out of your thinking, right? So he's on this very same subject, and, and he says, finally, my friends, keep your minds on. He's laying out this plan. He, he, he's, he's telling us this plan of how to overcome anxious thinking. Some versions say, focus your thoughts on. Keep your minds on or focus your thoughts on. And as we said last week, you could also say meditate. What you meditate on, the thing that you think about the most. And why is this important? Why is it important to, to change our focus, to change our thoughts? It is because what you set your focus on will drive what you look for and what thoughts you welcome and ultimately determine how you interpret communication and events around you. Let me even simplify it even more. Here's the real simple version of it. What you think about determines what you go about. Our thinking determines our doing, what we do in life. I double dog dare you to tell me one time that you did something without thinking about it. You, we don't do stuff without thinking about it. And you may say, well, Pastor Ken, what about what we've been talking about in this series, habits, that you do things without thinking about them? Well, how did you develop that habit? By thinking about it. How, so how do we uh, eradicate a bad habit? By changing our thinking. So everything that we do flows out of our thinking. So... How do negative thoughts, negative thoughts in our mind, how do they die? And, and if we could just get this and implement this in our lives, how do negative thoughts die? Again, we talked about this last week. They die from starvation. If those negative thoughts don't get fed by focusing on them, if they don't get attention, they will die. Do you know how they thrive? By feeding them. By, by thinking about them over and over again, that's how they grow. So how do you starve these negative thoughts? By replacing it with other thoughts. That's why the Apostle Paul said, don't be anxious, rather pray. He's given us this, this two things, two deals on the table. Don't be anxious, 
rather pray. So he's saying, saying star the anxious thoughts by replacing them with prayer thoughts. And then he gives us eight different types of thoughts to replace them with to get our thoughts to divinely line up with God's thoughts. He, he doesn't just say, don't do this, and then doesn't give us a way to get away from those thoughts. He spells out exactly how we can change our thoughts to line up with God's thoughts. So he says this in Philippians 4, 8. He says, finally, my friends, keep your minds on whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is holy, whatever is friendly and proper. Don't ever stop thinking. So these last two even takes it up a notch. We'll talk about this next week, why he takes it up a notch. Don't ever stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile and worthy of praise. He's saying, don't ever stop. Keep your mind set on whatever is worthy of praise. So we did true. A couple of weeks ago, we did true. But surprisingly enough, I have some more to add to true this morning. I, I want to add some stuff to true, keeping our focus on what is true. So what is the opposite of true? The opposite of true is not true, right? Or what we call a lie. So there's true or there's a lie. And let's see the contrast between truth and, and lie. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the what? The truth. So, so Jesus is saying, I am the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is saying, I am the truth. He's not just telling us what the truth is. He's saying, I am the truth. And that's why it's so important to get this, which this is Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Jesus and dwelt among us. So that's why it's so important to get this in here, to get the truth in us. Psalms 119, starting verse 10, it says, I trust in you with all my what? Heart. Don't let me wander away from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart. I have hidden this word in my heart so that I won't sin against you. So sometimes we think of this as a little kid scripture, you know, in kids church. Well, hide, hide the word in your heart so you won't sin. But it's not a little kid scripture. It's a little kid scripture and a big kid scripture. It's a scripture for all of us to have the word of God in our hearts so that we won't sin. Think about it. Think about that. The more of this that we have in here, the less we're going to sin. It's important to get this in here. Now, let's see the, the contrast. This next scripture, it's in um, a little dust up conversation that Jesus had with the Pharisees. Does anybody else find it interesting when you read the gospels that Jesus had more problems with the religious folk <laughs> than he did the sinners? The sinners he got along fine with, but the religious folk, he had massive problems with. This is in one of these dust ups with the religious folk, he's, he's talking to the Pharisees. In John chapter eight, verse 44, he says, your father is the devil. <laughs> I mean, Jesus didn't pull any punches, right? He's talking to the Pharisees that are all high and mighty. They think they're, you know, got it all together. And he says, 
your father is the devil and you do exactly what he wants. He has always been a murderer and a what? Liar. There is nothing truthful about him. He speaks on his own and everything he says is a what? A lie. Not only is he a liar himself, but here's the, the, the thing we want to focus on. But he is also the father of all lies. So he's a liar and all lies are descendants of him. Now, I don't want to get too spooky here. I don't want to spook anybody. But when you meditate on and believe a lie, you're being directed by the devil. When we choose to, to build up something in our minds that isn't true and focus on that, we're being directed or we're giving up control of our minds and being led by the enemy. When we build up this lie, that's why the Apostle Paul said to focus on what is true. Because when we have this thing in our mind that we've built up that isn't true at all, when we have that as our focus, it's really letting the devil, the enemy, control or lead our lives. That's why we have to pull down that thought and focus on what is true. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful for your word, God. I pray that each and every one of us, God, we, we commit anew to hiding your word in our hearts. God, to have, a, have your word on the inside of us so we won't sin against you, so we won't be led by the devil. God, I pray that each and every one of us recognizes the lies in our lives that we've been focused on and we change our focus to what is true. God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So next week we'll continue I'm going through those eight. We did true, we did pure last week and we'll continue with the, the next six. So after the service, we're gonna head right over to Lake Thai and uh, we're gonna be baptized. Are you guys excited? Yeah, excited, a little nervous. Yeah. I'm just concerned if it's cold or not. Oh, well, let me just set you straight. It'll be cold. <laughs> but I'll be in there with you. Okay. Okay. So um, I will see you guys over at Lake Tide. God bless you. Have a great day.